how do we have joy anyway, despite all of our circumstances? That's what we're going to be addressing today on Flourishment. I'm your host, Tina Yeager. Flourishment is sponsored by Access More. Do you want to go deeper in your faith even while you're on the go? No matter how busy the season you're in, Access More has a library of faith-based podcasts to help you grow spiritually. With podcasts from Christian thought leaders such as Christine Kane, Lisa Harper, Taryn Wells, and Bob Goff, you can hear podcasts on religion, culture, family, entertainment, and so much more. Access More gives you a safe space to find inspiring conversations about faith. Start listening today at accessmore.com. Today, I have a beautiful and precious guest with me. She is a keynote speaker, joy coach, and the author of Messy Joy, How Joy Can Begin Before Your Difficulties End. And that actually just went to number one on Amazon's new releases in Christian self-help. And this was recorded a little while ago, so just be aware if it's not there right now, it was. So that is a huge accomplishment. <laughs> this guest is Robin Shear. Welcome, Robin. I am so excited to see how you can share with us how to have joy anyway. Hi, Tina. Gosh, I'm so happy to be here with you today. I really look forward to this. <laughs> And so do I, I would love for you to share with the audience, what prompted your heart to talk about joy of all the topics you could have chosen. Why is this one close to your heart? And why do you think God called you to focus on this topic? I think that he called me to focus on the subject of joy because he helped me to just see it at work. In so many different situations. Um, I didn't grow up wanting to be a joy coach. I'd never heard of that before, but you know, I did want to do something that was helpful. Um, so I was a, a registered dietitian for a number of years. I worked with youth and youth ministry. I served senior citizens and activities, especially um, some wonderful folks that had different kinds of memory loss. And as a mother, as a wife, a regular person living a messy life and and doing this with all of these wonderful people, I really got to see the real concrete difference that joy made in each of those situations. You know, whether it was a teenager in distress trying to figure out how to do that particular day, or, you know, a senior citizen who just felt forgotten by the world, or a young person with anorexia nervosa, just pumping joy into those situations made such a difference in the outcome and in their ability to persevere despite their difficulties, that it became this, this common denominator. And I'll be completely honest. So, you know, when I got to the point where I was at the end of the third of those um, careers, those callings, I really didn't know what I was going to do next. I really wanted God to guide that. I just put myself in his lap and, and just wanted his direction. And, and yet in that time, I felt a bit like a failure in the sense that, you know, I couldn't stick a career out. I kept bumping around. I kept changing jobs. And it wasn't until actually a moment of prayer in this room, you know, where I really just wanted God to guide this next step of my journey that he made it really clear. I was not a failure. I was following him and joy was that ribbon that wove all of those things together. It was because of those different background pieces that he was positioning me to go out and share what I had experienced and, and witnessed and learned. So it was, it was a real beautiful moment with him. I love that personal story piece that, that God brought joy to you when you didn't see a way. And yeah. I am also going to ask in the situations where you said you applied joy with the teenager who couldn't make it through the day, with the elderly person who was hopeless, with all of those things that you mentioned, joy is kind of the last thing that you would think would work into that situation. Mm -hmm. How do mm -hmm. you put joy into, for example, one of the other things that you said, someone with anorexia nervosa, or a child or a teenager who's struggling with depression or anxiety. How do you make joy work with that? It seems counterintuitive that you would even introduce such a thing. And it also mm -hmm. seems like the client would be resistant to that idea in that moment. Mm -hmm. 
Oh yeah. And it's funny because, you know, our view of joy is kind of fluffy, <laughs> right? We don't see it as an essential component. It doesn't make the list of water and shelter and food and, you know, all those things that you have to have. And yet when you don't have it, you realize just how foundational it is. And like, okay, so going back to the example of, you know, the people with eating disorders, you know, these folks, they were coming to me for help with peace with food. You know, they, they had therapists um, that was required by me. <laughs> I felt that was really an important piece. And so they were working through their hurts with their therapist. And then they were coming to me to, to learn how to eat again and how to, how to view food differently. But what we discovered was there was more going on than just their approach to eating. It was really about their approach to recovery in general, because the work that they had to do was hard. Oh my gosh, it was so hard. And if they were going to commit to that level of work, there had to be a really good reason waiting on the other side. And there had to be something worthwhile in the moment. Because it's not just about, you know, when we graduate, it's about, you know, those day-to-day, -day, the grind that we're in. How do we feel in those moments when we're doing the difficult thing? And so it was really interesting because I never intentionally wove joy into my nutrition counseling sessions. And yet, like, I know that God has blessed me with an abundance of it. It just comes out. It's who I am. It's it's part of my my personality. And so our sessions were fun and uplifting and you know, we talked about a lot. It wasn't just about the food and the clients who were willing to really think about what was waiting on the other side and why they were going to do all this work when they had a really purposeful answer to that. And if joy was a part of that, they were the ones who recovered. They were the ones who had a reason to do the work. You know, it wasn't so that they could graduate from college and get a good job. It was so that they could have fun when they go to their family Christmas. It was so that, you know, they could go out on dates with their, their significant other. It was so that they could have peace at night when they sat there alone. So, but it was really about the joy. And I didn't know it at the time. It wasn't until that day I was sitting in this room praying that God made it really clear. That was the common denominator in all of it. And it just didn't have a name at that time. I saw that you got tearful when you were thinking of your clients <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and it reminded me of the importance of love and compassion and empathy and grace and all those pieces of God's perfect love that really are the most effective parts of therapy. And I wonder if that is also a component of the joy that you are talking about. You mentioned not a fluffy joy, not a dismissive uh, escapist kind of joy where we were, you know, kind of disconnecting from reality or pretending everything's fine when it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a different level of joy when you're weaving the love and grace and, and beauty of God's presence into that. So can you define where love fits in and actually what joy mm -hmm. is when you're talking about mm -hmm. joy, as opposed to other people's definitions? So I'll, I'll do my best to address those. So, you know, in terms of the definition of joy, this is a place that I think it's important to start with everyone. And, and what I have found is individuals have their individual definitions. There is no agreed upon definition. In fact, in the book that I wrote, you know, I dug into Google's definition, American Psychology Association's definition, the Bible dictionary definition, and they were all somewhat different. And I found that really interesting. So I think the main thing here is if an individual knows how they define joy, then they'll know what they're going after and when they achieve it. So in my personal definition, I mean, joy is really about resilience. It's about the hope that lasts. It's, it's about feeling good, but it's about feeling good long-term so that we have something to give to other people. It's about, you know, having this inner sense of effervescence for life itself. You know, it's not about the temporary circumstantial things that, that make us feel good. Those are things that bring happiness and we'd like to feel happy, but we know that that doesn't last. You know, we know that as soon as happiness ends, we, we hit a bit of a, a decline and then we start seeking it again. And pretty soon it's like this roller coaster ride, you know, we're up and we're down. Joy is, is longer lasting than that. And so it's deeper. And, and when we know Jesus, and when we receive the joy that he gives us 
freely as a gift. You know, we can't help but want to share that with other people. It does make our hearts sing. And, you know, you, you wonder where love comes in to all of this. Oh, love and joy. I mean, you can't separate the two of them. You, you cannot separate them. They're like, you know, they're, they're woven together. And, and there are so many other beautiful pieces woven into this as well. You know, the fruits of the spirit. You know, when we think about hope, when we think about peace, when we think about goodness, like, I mean, these are all things that play so nicely together for a reason. You know, it's because the Lord gives them to us. These are gifts when we're close to him, when we seek him, when we walk in his ways, you know, when we just humbly like ask him to be with us. We receive those things. And so, yeah, you can't help but feel that love. It, it just, it does bubble up and you do want to give it away. And that's another difference too, you know, joy and happiness. So, you know, our culture continually pushes this message that it's all about you. It's all about you. The only thing that matters is what you want. As long as you're not hurting anybody else, it doesn't matter, right? It's all about you. Get happy. Happiness feels good for you. Well, I have a real issue with that. Because, you know, if we are so focused on our own selves and our own happiness and what makes us feel good, we can completely miss the joy that comes with sharing that goodness with other people. And so, you know, if you follow me on social media, one of the things that I say frequently and I have a hashtag, feel good. I have it all over the place. Feel good. I want people to feel good, but not for selfish reasons. But so that they've got something to give to other people. That's the difference between joy and happiness, because joy is like a contagious shared thing. It feels so good. You don't want to keep it to yourself. Happiness is like my personal experience. Joy is a collective communal feeling of goodness. So Ooh. maybe that will help. I love that idea that joy is a communal experience and it's not selfish. In this second part of our wonderful interview with Robin Shear, I would love to delve into the nitty gritty, the practical steps that people can do to go from being joyless to joyful. Robin, do you have some advice for someone who is in a place where their life feels starved of joy, mm -hmm. where they're craving it, but it just seems to slip from their fingers. Maybe they're not in that communal joy place. The relationships they've had have been broken, or they've experienced grief or loss, or they've experienced negativity out of those relationships, perhaps even trauma or abuse. And they are not experiencing communal joy in any way. Maybe they are personally wounded, hurting, or alone no matter what the situation is, what would be that hopeless person's first step toward experiencing the kind of joy that you are saying is possible and reachable for them? You know, you have just perfectly described so many of the readers that I've met of Messy Joy. It's I've had a couple of book signings and it's been really beautiful to receive people's stories. And, you know, it does kind of get me going because these are real people and there's real hurt and there's a real need for this. It's not, it's not fluffy. It's foundational. It's just a sacred place to just be receiving, you know, where people really are and why they need joy so badly. It reinforces the fact that God is behind this book and other books like it. To answer your question, I think that, you know, it's important, first of all, for a person to believe, first of all, that joy exists. Because sometimes when we get so low and we have been hurting for so long, we forget that it's even possible. We forget that it's, that's, it's an option at all or that we deserve it in the first place. And so many of the people that I work with, you know, they are so committed to loving other people well. You know, they give their whole life whether it's their, their work or their family life or whatever, they, they just pour into other people. They want them to have joy. They believe you deserve it and here's how you should go get it. But when they look in the mirror, they don't have that same understanding on a personal level. They feel like they've done something wrong or you know they have to earn it. 
in some capacity. They have to do certain things before joy is possible for them too. You know, maybe they've made mistakes in the past or they've just been hurting for so long. And so to answer your question, I mean, the first place is really just getting clear on whether or not you believe that joy is possible. That's not an easy task. I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that you just check that right off the list. It really does take some inner work. That's why we have therapy. You know, that's why we have coaching, because I think that we need to get into where that comes from and, and figure out how it might be stopping us from living that life of fullness that the Lord wants us to live. And so, yep, checking in and just making sure that you believe that joy is possible. And then, you know, when you get to a place where you're like, yep, I get it. I want it. It's, it's like something that I need. Then the question becomes, what lights me up? You know, where, where have I felt most alive? Where have I just felt like I could fly? You know, what are experiences or relationships or situations or, you know, um, memories that just really make me feel like I'm living abundantly? Those are the types of things to dig into more often and make happen on a more regular basis. Like on a personal level, I can tell you that one of the things that brings me the most joy in my list is really long, but is live Christian music. And when COVID hit, oh man, it was so hard to just stop going to all the Christian concerts. I mean, that is, you do not want to sit next to me in a stadium where somebody <laughs> is singing live Christian music. Like all of my parts are flailing. Like I can hardly contain my joy. It just comes out of every cell that I've got. And so I know that about myself. And so therefore I make it a point then to seek out these Christian concerts. You know, I know what brings me joy and I do something about it. And I believe that I deserve it. Not just the people that I love, but I deserve it. I'm a daughter of the King. Like he wants me to have fullness of life. It's not just for other people. And when I feel good, I can help other people feel good as well. So there we go. Back to that communal joy thing. The feeling good is about helping other people feel good. And those once in a while experiences are fantastic things to set before us as great, wonderful treats. What are some ways that people can plug joy into their daily lives, into the way that they do all the things that they do? Such a good question because I can't go to see Toby Mac every day of the week. Right? <laughs> Wouldn't like that to. be great, but no. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So yeah, where do we find joy in the everyday mundane? You know, where do I find it when I have 10 errands that I have to run or when my friend is going through chemotherapy for breast cancer? You know, where do I find it in the trenches of life? And that that is a very personal thing. You know, I can use myself as an example. Like I know that connection is a big one for me. And I can connect with people that I care about or strangers every single day of the week. And when I don't feel like myself, you know, when my own joy bucket is running a little on the low side, I'll check in and I'll ask myself, wow, how long has it been since you've actually connected with someone? Am I so busy doing other things that I've just tuned people out altogether? So it's about knowing what brings you joy and then checking in, you know, when you're running a little bit low and you could even, if you really want to win, you could even schedule, you know, on a regular basis, things into your day that, you know, are going to fill you up so that you overflow. So for example, if connection is the example, you know, I could put in a recess break every day at two o'clock into my phone and I could have an alarm go off and every day at two o'clock, I could use that five minutes to reach out to somebody. I could connect with you. I could connect with other Christian authors, family members, people that I run into, but I, it's an intentional choice on my part to do something that I know is meaningful that brings me joy. But again, like it, it allows me to give that away, right? So everywhere I go, I like to get stories. And so it doesn't have to be someone that I know. I, I find a lot of joy in just meeting people where they are, so. So I love that you are getting us to do more and more often things that bring us joy, that fill us up. But could joy also be not just about what we do, but how we do the things that we have to do? Mm -hmm. Sometimes the ordinary things and the hard things, can you find and apply joy yeah. in those things as well? 
Oh, what a good question. I love that. And I don't think any podcast host has ever asked me that question. So <laughs> go flourishment. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, the answer is a definite yes. Uh, especially when you find joy in things like gratitude. So, you know, if you know that gratitude fills you up with joy and, and you are living in the mundane every day and you stop and, and dig into what about that situation makes you grateful, you, you'll just naturally fill with joy. So as an example, okay. So my friend who's going through chemotherapy for breast cancer, I mean, it's really hard for a person in that situation to walk in and say, wow, I am so grateful for this. Right. But what happens, you know, when we stop and think, gosh, I'm so grateful that God made people smart enough to figure out how to make these medicines in the first place. Like I didn't ask for cancer. I didn't ask for whatever diagnosis, but I am so grateful that help is available. And I am so grateful that I had a car that got me to treatment today. Like there are people in other countries who walk for days to get medical care. We've heard about those stories. I got in a car and I drove, I got right to my appointment. I'm so grateful that my husband's job provides insurance so that I don't have to pay for all of this out of pocket. I don't have to remortgage my house. I don't have to live on the streets to pay for my treatment. Wow, I have the resources to get the help that I need. And I'm so grateful for the kindness and the nurse's eyes. You know, they come in, they check on me, they adjust my meds, they bring water, they care about me. Like I can feel their compassion. And I'm so grateful to be receiving that. So, I mean, we could talk about that one thing all day long. And I think that, you know, because gratitude and joy play so nicely together, I feel like that's one that pretty much everyone can relate to. And so when a person is really in the grind, when they're in the everyday activities, I would invite them to really dig into gratitude and allow that to bring joy. And, you know, in America, you know, we have Thanksgiving and we go around the table and we talk about what we're thankful for. And I love that tradition, but I think sometimes we phone it in just a little bit on that. You know, we just quickly spout out our answers without really giving thought to why those things matter. And, you know, the type of gratitude that I'm talking about is really about why. Get into the nitty gritty. And if it's hard to think of something, that's okay. Get down to the granular level then. Think about the joy that you can find because you're thankful for the fact that you got out of bed to go to treatment at all that day. But get down into the details and pretty soon you'll find you're so full of joy. Like, yep, you're still going to chemotherapy but there is joy to be found in that circumstance. Robin, do you have any final words that you want to leave with the audience to encourage them on how they can get joy, even if it's messy? Yeah, I, I think that my final thought there is to embrace the fact that you can have messy joy. Like so often we look at messes as bad things. You know, we, we think, you know, if something's dirty, we need to clean it up. What if we look at our messes differently? What if because of the messes, joy is possible? Like there are so many times that, you know, joy wouldn't have happened without some crazy circumstance in the first place, without that dirty mess. And so my thought is, let's embrace it. Let's embrace those times when things aren't perfect and they don't go according to plan. Where is the goodness? Like, where is the blessing? How is God using that to reach you and to fill you up so that you overflow? So embrace those moments of messy joy. That's my advice. It sounds like art. Uh, nothing beautiful <laughs> comes until after you've made a big mess first. So yes. I love that. <laughs> yes, I do too. <laughs> I hope that you have all enjoyed this artful and lovely conversation with Robin Shear. And I hope that you will connect with her at her website. Robin, can you list your website again in the title of your book and how people can connect with you? I can. My, my website is joytotheworldcoaching.com. And I've just put up a 30 day messy joy journal. So if you'd like to get 30 days of questions to help you dig into the subject of messy joy, 
They're free. They're over at joytotheworldcoaching.com slash messy joy questions. That is the world's longest website. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Robin. I hope that you will go and connect with the world's longest website because it's worth <laughs> it to connect with Robin. And of course, I also hope that you come back for the next episode of Flourishment. Flourishment is part of the Spark Media Network and can be found on the Edify app.